There we go. Um, so for image feedback, um, yeah, the image sensor is a particular sensor with a, with a certain modality that, that we have to pay very special attention to in the sense that it has a limited field of view. And um, even while it's observing a target, um, it's very easy for there to be occlusions or um, saturation. You know, basically, maybe, maybe the sun comes out of a shadow and and erases your feature points, or maybe a shadow comes across your scene and erases your feature points. Um, essentially, there's a lot of ways that your feature points or the feedback that you're getting from the image to temporarily go away. And I mean, image feedback is an incredible sensor for in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and guidance, navigation, control of vehicles. Um, I think you'll see lots of presentations throughout the day today that deal with the inherent nonlinearities of the image space to Euclidean space transformation. Um, but but my talk is is focused on how do we deal with these occlusions or the lack of feedback that can happen intermittently. Um, there are ways to get around that. Um, you can have multiple imagers that um, seek to provide redundancy um, image information. Um, for example, there's a concept called synthetic persistence, which if you're tracking a target, um, you just make sure that there's always cameras that are covering that target. It doesn't have to be from the same imager. It can be from multiple different imagers. That's the synthetic persistence. Um, you could also do path planning methods so that if your camera is moving through a scene and it needs to view certain objects in order to localize itself, that it keeps those, it's moving in a way that keeps those objects in the field of view. Um, that's a very traditional approach uh, for localization. Um, but then there's also cases where um, because of the natural scene, um, the features leave the field of view. Um, and we wanna be robust to those kind of situations. Also, if we figure out a way to allow ourselves to have intermittent viewing of a target, then maybe we can use that to our advantage. So maybe, for example, if we're trying to do path planning and we need to see a target for localization, that might yield non-optimal paths to keep that target in the field of view. But if we can intermittently let it go out of the field of view, then maybe we can plan a more optimal path that will take the object out of the field of view but then maybe we just have to look at it every so often in order to be able to still maintain an accurate estimate of where we are and still be able to navigate in the environment. Um, and that understanding of how often we need to be able to look at the target or for how long can the object be out of the field of view um, is exactly um, what we get through um, a switch systems um, uh, theoretical framework or hybrid systems framework. Essentially that when, when using this kind of a framework, you have to focus not only on the stability of the system when you have feedback, but you also have to focus on the dwell time conditions or the timing of when you have feedback and when you don't have feedback or when you're switching between different subsystems. Um, and so there's this famous example that I show in the bottom. This is a cartoon drawing of a Lyapunov function. And you can see each of those squiggles are meant to be a decaying Lyapunov function. And so this would be an example where you're switching between different subsystems that are stable but even there's the counter example that even when switching between globally exponentially stable subsystems, you can switch in a way that can destabilize the system. And worse yet, um, we wanna focus on problems where in the image feedback domain, where we're not just switching between different 
stable subsystems, but we're switching between a stable subsystem and an unstable subsystem. And the unstable subsystem comes from the fact that when we don't have feedback, we're, we're essentially dead reckoning, or we, we essentially have an open loop estimate of where we are in the world. Um, and, th and that's gonna be unstable over time. And so what the switch systems analysis will enable us to do and, and these kinds of discontinuities or this mixed discrete and continuous time environment can come from sensor or communication dynamics, which is what we're gonna be focusing on today. It could come from the vehicle dynamics or decision logic. There's a large community of people who are working in this space based on those kind of motivations. And what these switch systems tools allow us to do is um, provide performance certificates, in some cases provide scalability bounds, and very important for application today, gives us timing conditions. Um, as I said earlier on, how long do I need to observe a, or, or see a target, have information back from my imager, and how long can I tolerate that being out of my field of view? Um, and again, to the left is a, is a cartoon of a Lyapunov function where um, the green is when we have feedback and our Lyapunov function is decaying and we can talk about stability things during those times. And the red are periods when we don't have feedback and um, we have instability, meaning our Lyapunov function is growing. But based on this cartoon, provided I can adjust the timing so that I only grow so much and I converge fast enough, then in this cartoon, I can maybe converge to some ultimate bound. Um, and this ultimate bound, these is gonna depend on my convergence rate and my divergence rate. And then, I can develop timing conditions based on those convergence and divergence rates to understand, as I mentioned earlier, how long I need to watch the target. So how, how far down does my Lyapunov function need to come? And how long can I withstand not looking at the target? So how much growth can I tolerate? Now, a, a, an interesting thing with this though, is that you know you can understand maybe how to develop these ratios if if everything is is exponential or you have some known convergence and known divergence rates um, but if we're doing um, some kind of an estimator or observer um, we're trying to learn some parameters of a system which is often the case in in imaging systems that's typically an asymptotic convergence rate. And so therein lies the large technical challenge in the sense that um, how do we deal with switch systems when we're doing adaptive control methods? And then in adaptive control, we would typically have asymptotic convergence. And then how can you develop these timing conditions and dwell time conditions for stability if you just simply know um, asymptotic convergence. So I'll answer that in a, in a few moments, um, but let me show you a few motivating examples. Um, here we have a, a quadcopter that's trying to track multiple ground vehicles across a, a um, virtual road network. And uh, it's able to do that, not by just going high enough so that it can see both targets, but through this strategy that we're gonna to develop today, for example, it understands the timing of how long it needs to stay with a target and how quickly it can switch and how long it can go without seeing the target. And so you can see in the little window down to the left, it's obviously that's the onboard camera view and obviously it's switching back and forth across the two targets. Um, we've got QR tags on there so that we to facilitate the image recognition part of the problem, which is you know, not really what we're looking at here. Um, but these kinds of applications can be enabled by 
this kind of technique. Um, we can have other problems. So the window in the upper right is the true value of this mobile robot location in green and the blue is the estimate. And while it's in the field of view, um, we can predict its motion pretty well. There's tons of literature available to enable us to do that. But when it goes out of the field of view, but when you look at that ton of literature, it typically assumes that the target remains in the field of view. And that's maybe not always the case. Um, as you can see in the video, sometimes it goes out of the field of view. And this first part of the video is using a static camera um, looking at a target. Um, and then we can also have a moving camera looking at a moving target. Um, now there's various assumptions that are going on here behind the scene. Um, and frankly, I can't remember them all. I, I think that the motion of the camera is known. And I think there's some information maybe known about the motion model of the, um, the mobile robot here. But you can see here's an occlusion where um, the person even puts their hand over the lens while the both the mobile robot and the camera are moving. And so being able to know, for example, the motion model of the vehicle um, is important to help us predict where the target is going to be when it comes back into the field of view. Now, one thing that you can do, um, and in fact, if if you gave this to an engineer, um, their first assumption would be, okay, I'm just gonna do a zero order hold uh, whenever the target's out of the view and I'm just gonna kind of freeze my estimate of where it is until I get feedback again. And if you look at this series of plots on the right, um, that's exactly what we do. Uh, so the vertical stripes are um, instances where um, you're not able to see the target. So for example, but between like, I don't know, 22 and like 25 seconds, there's this period where it, it, it didn't have feedback and this is the predictor estimating in here. Um, oh, this, uh, that's probably not a zero order hold. <laughs> this looks like a predictor, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I can show using a zero order hold. And here you can see where the predictor is just held flat. Um, you can show that if the switching is slow enough that in fact the zero order hold works. But here's an example uh, where this is the switching on and off and it's not all that fast, frankly. Um, but this is switching sufficiently fast enough that it's not really tracking the um the 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 blue curve which is the true um motion um very well i mean you wouldn't call this convergence right um but when we replace the zero order hold with a predictor um you can see that the predictor um has an accurate prediction of the target and so even when there are periods where the target is out of the field of view the red curve lies on top of the blue curve and we have really nice convergence. Now, we would see a similar kind of performance with the zero order hold again, if the switching were done in, an, in a certain way, if it was slow enough, um, then you can show that the zero order hold in fact is stable using an analysis. But with a predictor, um, the predictor decreases the amount of, um, the pace of the instability, if you will, um, and therefore you're able to handle faster switching. And that's what this example shows. Um, so that brings us to a big question. So how do we ensure adaptive state estimation while switching between stable and unstable dynamics? And so one of the strategies that we employ here, again, is, is using switch systems methods to develop dwell time conditions. And the way that we address the, the problem of potentially only having asymptotic convergence is to use this method called integral concurrent learning or concurrent, it's a, which is a variant of concurrent learning. And that is a persistence of excitation like condition, but it's much less restrictive and it can be verified online as I'll talk about in a moment. 
And what that does, similar to persistence of excitation, allows us to get an exponential convergence rate. Um, and so then we're able to show exponential convergence of the adaptive subsystem when we have image feedback exponential divergence when we don't have feedback, but then because we have known convergence and divergence rates, we're able to develop a dwell time condition to know exactly um, when we can trust our estimates based on the switching frequency. Um, so the integral concurrent learning um, looks like this first equation where uh, theta hat is um, a traditional adaptive update law uh, for some parameters, for example. So suppose you have a motion model that is parameterized in, in some way and you want to learn the parameters of that motion model. So these terms in blue, they could be your standard gradient update law terms to cancel cross terms in your stability analysis. Um, but the integral concurrent learning, which, which would only yield asymptotic convergence um, because you're going to lose the theta tilde from the Lyapunov function and then your Lyapunov analysis, you're only going to get a negative semi-definite result because you're, you don't have a negative theta tilde squared kind of feedback in your Lyapunov derivative. But these terms in the um, kind of tan color here, um, this is based on a collection of input output data. So while we're executing, we collect input output data pairs. Uh, so the input here is the control input, U, and the output is the state. And so I collect the state. And so the sub I means this is an instant of time that I collected. Um, and this is integral concurrent learning. So I'm going to integrate over some window of time. That's delta T, and that's a user defined parameter. Here's my input u. And then um, here is also my input, my theta hat um, as a function of time. And also um, yi is just my regressor. Um, that's a measurable thing, but it's a matrix of data at, at the ith time instant. And if I can, and all of these are available from the data that I'm collecting uh, while I have measurements, and through some analysis, you can show that, that all of these terms together um, are equal to a, y, a script yi theta tilde, which is also multiplied by this script yi transpose. And so you get a y transpose y theta tilde, just like you would in a traditional persistence of excitation type of uh, analysis or uh, assumption, where then you, and as I'll show you in a moment, um, the, the traditional PE assumption is that the integral um, of Y transpose Y is uh, positive, is greater than some positive number. And that's not known in general for nonlinear system, nor can it be verified online. Um, so you can assume persistence of excitation, but um, you can't do anything to this signal for general nonlinear systems to ensure that, that nor can you check if, if it's true. But the beauty of this condition in, in TAN here is that this is a summation condition. And um, you're just going to check the summation of Y transpose Y. And if you have a positive eigenvalue from that summation, then you have sufficient information to have a negative theta tilde squared type term, um, which gives you a negative definite result, which can lead to exponential stability after some time, capital T. Um, so you have to have some amount of time to collect enough data in order to show the exponential convergence. Um, and this slide basically um, establishes what I just said. Um, so now I want to go on to uh, an example um, to show you how we're using this integral concurrent learning in a particular application. So here you've got people that are observing monitors um, in, a, in a kind of a low density environment where you don't have 100% coverage of an area. 
Um, so the cameras may be uh, sporadically spaced along a trajectory of some of some agent. And so obviously um, you're switching between different subsystems, maybe the blue sets of cameras and the and the orange sets of cameras, and or or maybe every camera has different parameters. Um, but when you're in view of those cameras, then it's a stabilizable subsystem. Um, and lots of methods are out there that are available. Um, but then when you're outside of the camera field of view, when there's gaps, you want to predict the trajectory of the target so that um, you can either design your camera system to make sure that it's sufficiently dense even if it doesn't completely cover the environment, um, or you wanna guarantee that you can trust your estimate of the trajectory of the target, um, even when it's outside of the field of view. Um, so uh, these are measurements that our cameras can make. Um, and while we are measuring, we can also try to learn opportunistically, try to learn a motion model for the target. Uh, so this is like a traditional observer strategy where um, I can measure my output um, and I'm going to use the measurement of my output and I'm going to develop an observer of that output and I'm going to drive that error to zero, meaning that my observer has converged and then when I don't have feedback, then I can use that observer to reconstruct that feedback. Or in this case, I can use that observer to reconstruct the motion model uh, when it's out of the field of view. And those are indicated in these red lines. So um, I think you'll see similar kinds of uh, image kinematics and, and you know, pixel coordinates and the transformation between pixel coordinates and Euclidean coordinates probably throughout the day today. It's a complicated problem. There's a lot of ongoing interesting work to focus on that, on that problem. But here, um, let me just state, let me just state that when the target's in the field of view, I have measurement of eta and eta dot, and when it's outside of the field of view, I don't. Um, that's kind of the major point for um, this talk. And so, and, and eta represents the position and uh, the, the linear position and rotation of the target, and then eta dot represents the linear and angular velocity. And so uh, when I can observe, when I can see the target, then I can have this um, observer error is essentially what it is, or state estimation error, where eta is the actual position and orientation, eta hat is my estimated position and orientation. Um, then I have some state estimation error or dynamic, um, eta dot, and then I'm gonna put a U here to denote this is my state estimation error when I'm still able to see the target. Um, and the motion of the target, the trajectory of the target, I don't know the trajectory of the target, I don't know the motion model, but I can approximate it through a neural network. And that is a function of its current position and orientation. Um, and so I can develop a state update law and key in this, so you can see here that I'm, I have an estimate for my motion model and I wanna learn those parameters of the system. And what's also key is that I have measurement of eta and I, I'm designing eta hat. So I have measurements of eta tilde. Um, and so everything in here is, is measurable um, or known. Um, and the, the eta hat and eta hat dot are going to be generated from this weight estimate error. Um, so um, this eta hat dot has w hat. So this is my eta hat dot observer design, where w hat is given from um, this design here. And in here, you can see some of these um, integral concurrent learning based data terms and the summation. And those concurrent learning terms are what's gonna enable me to show through my stability analysis that after some time, capital T, that I can learn the motion model with an exponential convergence rate. 
Um, and so by doing a Lyapunov analysis, again, I get some exponential convergence rate, um, <clears throat> at least to a ball, um, um, even, even before my learning um, in this particular example. Um, and th but this ball is large. Um, but then after I have sufficient data, then I can ensure exponential convergence to a much smaller ball, CUB. Now, when I don't have measurements of the, when I can't see the target, I still have the same situation here, but now my, my estimate or my predictor here, I don't have eta or eta tilde available for feedback. So I'm just gonna, feedback my approximate model of the of the dynamics with the approximate um, state estimate eta hat. So again, this is implementable, but I'm just feeding forward my model of what I think is going to happen. And um, the w hat here is strictly the um, concurrent learning the data pieces. So I don't have any current time information to use here, but I did have a collection of input output data that was available when I was making measurements. And so I can still use that data here to propagate my weight estimate um, forward in time. So you'll see A to I here and you'll see A to I dot. And you may think, well, wait a minute. I thought that he wasn't measuring these things now. But these are sampled things that were from the collected data from previously, and those are going to be used to propagate my estimate for those model parameters, even when I'm not viewing the target. And I think you'll probably see some talks later on today that are along those same lines. Um, and whenever my target isn't available and I substitute in those predictors, those estimators, um, then I get in instability um, because I don't have I don't have feedback to give me my negative you know kx squared kind of term and in fact I can show that it, it exponentially grows which is this red curve here but I understand the growth rate and that growth rate is smaller by using the predictor than if I were just to use a zero order hole or something else but one could design different predictors to maybe get an even slower um, growth rate. And so we've got three kind of periods to look at here. Uh, one is um, when I can see the target, but I haven't learned the model yet. Um, green is I'm seeing the target and enough data has been collected that I've learned the motion model. And then the red is I don't see the target. I'm feeding forward some predictor, some estimate of the motion model. And that's because it's just open loop, it's going to um, be unstable. But if I can control the timing of these different convergence rates and, and growth rate, then overall, I can show convergence and stability. Um, and so if I look at it for one snapshot, um, this is just kind of collecting everything together. Um, and I can combine all that information. I can have a user-defined upper bound tolerance. Um, you know, I only want the error to get so big, V upper bar, that's a user defined parameter. And by doing that, and after multiple, you know, doing some, some manipulations with the math, I can get this timing condition that says how long I can go without seeing the target. And um, unsurprising, it's, it, it's a function of the upper bounds, um, beta one and CUB. <clears throat> And it's a function of the convergence rates, um, delta uh, lambda d, and um, the growth rates, um, lambda. Um, oh, that's I guess it's just included in in CUB. Um, Hi, Warren. I, I hate to interrupt, but I know I only have a couple yeah, more slides. That's yep. cool. All right, and then. Um, also, um, I can determine the minimum amount of time that I need to continuously see the target so that I can have convergence or I can have my error converge small enough. 
Um, and then in terms of planning my camera placement, I can predict kind of this ball of error growth based on my minimum observation time and my maximum time away from it being seen. And that can tell me where I need to place my next camera um, if, if that's something that I wanna know in order to ensure that um, I'm gonna have a stable estimate of where the trajectory of the trajectory. Um, so then just last thing again, um, I can use this to my advantage and I can plan paths um, unique to allow the target to go out of the field of view. Um, here's a very preliminary experiment still. Um, and you can see that instead of doing a drive forward and back up and drive forward and back up kind of trajectory to keep that target in the field of view, <clears throat> I just kind of drive around it until my dwell time condition says, oh, hey, you need to look at that again. And then I turn to look and, and that prediction error of where to turn to look is built into the analysis and the timing. And then I can continue around the box. And this is the um, trajectory of that. Here's some publications that are available um, that, that show some of the work that I showed today. Um, so thanks everyone for your time.